Welcome back. I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor at AdvisorAnalyst.com, and this is Raise Your Average. Richard Latterman, Portfolio Manager at Resolve Asset Management, is co-hosting with me. Richard, great to see you. Great to see you too. Thanks for having me. Our special guest today is no stranger to the intricacies of the global economy and financial markets. Joaquin Kritz Lara is here. Joaquin is Chief Economist at Numera Analytics and spearheads the firm's macro research practice. Not only is he at the helm of Numera's macro product suite, which encompasses in-depth research on the world economy and strategic insights on major asset classes, but he also plays a pivotal role in designing and supervising the implementation of Numera's econometric models. These models are crucial for forecasting, portfolio construction, and quantitative research. Joaquin's expertise doesn't stop there. His research is primarily centered on understanding the ripple effects of, of macro shocks on asset prices and delving deep into the design and evaluation of probability forecast models. With a master's in economics from University College London and a bachelor's degree from McGill University, Joaquin brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table. So without further ado, let's dive into today's conversation with Joaquin Kritzlera. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Thank Joaquin. You thank you for having me. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Looking forward to our discussion. Joaquin, before we get started, for those of us who aren't familiar with you and your work, tell us about the arc of your career, uh, how you got into the business, and what's got you fired up these days at Numera. So I started off, uh, I'm more of a classical economist by training. Uh, a lot of the work uh, initially that, that I did was more in the, what is sort of the macro econometric space, which is essentially model building for either forecasting or structure analysis, so understanding causal implications between economic variables or between economic and financial variables. Um, so people like me often will work at places like the Fed, the IMF, the ECB, and obviously also at, at hedge funds and, you know, within the institutional investment space. Um, I started off doing work primarily in the real economy and commodity markets. Uh, that's what I've done for the beginning of the first, you know, six, seven years of my career. And then uh, this was within within the firm and we catered to a primarily uh, multinational corporations in, in this space. And then we built our macro practice, which deals with uh, the investment side, primarily the buy side. I started building this about six or seven years ago. Um, and, it, you know, basically mapping the knowledge and the toolkit that I had, but onto uh, financial markets with, as, as you pointed out, the, the sort of uh, uh, key workforce behind our work is the probabilistic approach, where um, it, 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 it was very natural to us in the commodity space where forecasting things like oil prices or the price of natural gas or, or, or copper or, or even currencies is extremely complicated and carries a, a whole array of uncertainty, right? And so to us, thinking from a probabilistic framework uh, was very natural in the sense that I'm probably not going to be able to tell you that what the barrel will look like in 12 months time, the margin of error of that, regardless of whether you're a very good forecaster or a very bad forecaster, is going to be very large anyways. It's more informative to track the risk of certain events materializing or the probability of, of you experiencing some events, even just getting things directionally right. I mean, if you're, say, a foreign exchange trader or something like that, or a rates trader, just even getting it directionally right is everything, right? And so right. Uh, to us, it, 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 it was... It has always been much more important to think about the world and especially asset prices that carry a lot of uncertainty from a realistic standpoint. And the reality is that the industry really, it, it's quite rare for people to do this, uh, especially strategists, which te who tend to be more qualitative in nature, or there's pressure for them to have very strong opinions about a certain topic. And, and that opinion can create 
an excessive amount of bias when really what you want to be doing is understa understanding and quantifying uncertainty. And so that's where the work that I do and what my firm does comes into play. Excellent. So you guys marry quantitative analysis with a qualitative perspective. That's right. right. You, what some people like to call quantum mental. Exactly. So what is the, uh, how are you seeing markets today at a very higher level in terms of the trade-offs. You, you were kind enough to share some of your analytics mm -hmm. uh, and your more recent pieces with us uh, before the call. And uh, I guess it's useful for all of our listeners to, to get a sense of where you guys are coming from and, and the way you're seeing markets currently. Yeah. So the way we typically will look at the world, uh, very, you know, top down, uh, there's often a, a, a preliminary assessment of how the global economy is evolving and attempting to disentangle signals that make Harry predictive content over asset prices. We do this probabilistic, probabilistically. What we're really interested here is not just what the business cycle will look like, but it's really anticipating shifts in what, what we would call macroeconomic regimes. So the likelihood of, say, developed markets shifting from what basically experiencing overheating in the last year, year and a half, uh, towards something else, right? Whether it's a soft landing or not. And so it's really the interaction between multiple forces that you're interested in to be able to make money here or, or, or minimize portfolio losses. So it's the interaction between growth, inflation, monetary policy. And if you're investing offshore, you really care about the dollar and commodities as well. So that's always um, sort of the first step for us. And what we attempt to do is we build models that, as you were saying, they incorporate insights from economic theory as well as more statistical techniques, uh, some akin to some of the stuff that is used in, in machine learning. It's not really that. We have more of a Bayesian view of the world. But um, okay. the point is that it's very important to get those dynamics right. And then from that, then you can map what that means for portfolio construction, right? So for example, assessing the, you know, for example, is the market pricing in uh, the outlook for Fed policy correctly? Uh, are they excessively hawkish relative to what macro fundamentals would suggest? And from that, you can then map what that means for the stock bond mix. Uh, should you be prioritizing certain styles or sectors if you're investing in North America? Or what does that mean for other asset classes? Say, if the dollar were to, if, if that translates into high probability of appreciation, that obviously will affect how you rotate geographically, for instance, right? And so um, what we're basically picking up, um, sort of broad picture, given the current uh, environment, is we're getting a really strong signal that the world economy, and especially developed markets, so sort of G10 countries, are entering... Mm -hmm on um, what we would call a late cycle. A late cycle is um, what usually tends to follow overheating. It's very difficult to time, but and, and it's been a while since we, we observed a late cycle. And then what follows from a late cycle would be, you know, the worst possible outcome would be either a stagflation or a deep downturn. But you could also have something that is more akin to stagnation, or if you get really lucky, you could get a soft, soft landing, although that seems to be quite rare. The point is that in that window of time that is the late cycle, there are very concrete strategies that you that we think you should be conducting, both from a global standpoint and also in terms of sector rotation or style rotation and so on. And so I, I, what I think helps is to sort of list what are the characteristics of the late cycle and then from that think, okay, are we there? Are we going to move towards that? Uh, you know, or, or are we looking at something entirely different? And it, it basically, you know, the, 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 the three classic examples of a late cycle that I would give in the last two, three decades would be the late 1980s, beginning of 1990s, so ahead of the savings and loan crisis of the, of the early 90s, then 2000, and then the preeminent example was 2007. In 2007, in the second half of 2007, we had still resilient economic activity, but leading indicators, including the yield curve, pointing towards a downturn. We have that right now. We had policy rates in most developed markets peaking uh, or already at their peak, which is probably where we are or very close to where we are. 
you had real borrowing costs that were very high relative to the previous, say, five years. We have that already. You actually had commodity inflation, uh, which is also something that we're seeing right now. You had inflation expectations that were above average. It, the dynamic was a little different because, you know, they had been above average for a while, whereas now it's above average but declining type of thing. But anyways, you, you had that. And you had expensive equity valuations. Um, if I describe that to you today, and that we've seen that consistently, you know, in the last three or four times, that sound, that's exactly where we are right now, right? So right. it's not that uncommon. We're, we're not in a situation that's that rare in terms of history. And, and what I think is most important is when you identify, you know, that aspect, I, I would add, though, the one key difference is that in a late cycle, the dollar weakens and we're not there. Right. We did see right. a weak dollar in the first half of this year and really in the second half of last year. And it started to reverse in the last three months or so. So I would argue that that's probably the, 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 the biggest difference. But for everything else really points towards that. Um, and if you look at asset performance over that period, um, it, it turns out that there's these very concrete patterns that you can identify. And the most important one, and I think this ties into the million dollar question, which is rates uh, and, and Fed policy, is that in late cycle, sovereign bonds are performing. Um, and that is not something that you see in overheating and certainly not earlier in the economic cycle, like during the reflation. Um, and they start out performing for a variety of reasons. The first one is that Earlier in the cycle, you, have, you get these sort of continuous upward revisions in expectations around policy rates where the market thinks, say, that the ECB is going to raise rates twice, but then they end up raising rates four times, and so that, that causes expectations to adjust, and that drives down the price of sovereign bonds, right? So it drives up yields and therefore prices right. go down. Um, and so you have this pattern that's pretty much consistent throughout overheating where debt does really bad. Um, especially things like fixed income ETFs, that sort of thing. Um, now that's maybe not entirely gone, but there's a lot less, uh, you know, the likelihood of that happening is, is, is much lower, right? If I were to ask you, do you think that the Fed is going to hike five more times now? You would probably tell me that's nearly impossible, right? But maybe seven months ago, that wasn't the case. Um, and so that by itself tends to improve significantly um, the the risk reward balance that it, it basically makes for an attractive entry point, I would say. Um, right. That, and then the second thing is that you often have, I'm sure that you've been hearing the word term premium being thrown around a lot recently. What you often get is this widening of the term premium, which has been super amplified in the last two months here, which just so everyone is, is, is clear that the audience is clear. What, what strategists mean by the term premium, it's the extra compensation um, that you pay for duration risk. So basically, right. um, if, if you're going to buy a 10-year bond, uh, in principle, you should be indifferent between buying that bond and holding it until maturity and buying a whole bunch of three months and then just rolling over that, uh, that risk. But the reality is that there's an opportunity cost in holding that uh, you know, of, of putting a chunk of money and holding it for 10 years. And so the gap between both of those things is the term premium. If, when the term premium widens a lot, that's usually unsustainable. It's usually linked to speculation or sentiment of some kind. Um, and that makes for an even more attractive point because what then happens is that what usually follows a late cycle is at least, it, in, most likely some kind of stagnation. And with stagnation comes flight to safety demand, which is just simply isn't there today, right? And that right. will drive up prices. And so where we are now in terms of, you know, our, our broad recommendation, we were, from, from a global portfolio standpoint, we were neutral, I would say, three months ago. Uh, so entering the fall, we, you know, we thought that a 60-40 was probably okay, uh, we liked the U.S. more than than we than we liked the rest of the world. Um, there were some opportunities in EM, but then you had this worries around China, which sort of uh, made it a little more uh, yeah. uncertain uh, than than you would usually get in the late cycle. Um, so what? What came? Now we're more conservative. Yeah. 
that now we are both tactically. So even within the next three months where, you know, we're going to remain, chances are in this late cycle and further out, if you're investing more strategically, say one year out, we are now seeing that slightly more conservative allocations. I'm not saying 2080, I'm saying more like a 45, 55 type thing, um, greatly improves the projected risk adjusted return of a portfolio based again on underlying macro dynamics, if that makes yeah. sense. So, so Joaquin, where, where was the term premium say six months ago? And, uh, thanks for explaining what the term premium is. Um, but more importantly, what, what's, what is the significance of the term premium in the current market scenario? Uh, it's definitely, I mean, uh, just to, um, seed the conversation has definitely put pressure upward on yields. Uh, the, the closing of the gap, the closing of the spread, but what was the spread, uh, six months ago, uh, or a year uh, ago it, and, it was, and, and what it, is it, it now? Was, yeah. So it was zero to negative, uh, six months ago. So there was no, you know, investors were not willing to pay a premium or they were not demanding a premium for holding longer term debt today. It's about. It's a, on the 10 year that we estimated a little over 100 basis points, meaning that the way to think about this would be if it were only uh, due to macro fundamentals, by which I mean growth, inflation, and Fed policy expectations, you should be looking at a 10 year that would be trading at around 3.6, but it's trading at 4.7. Right. right. And his, just to give you a bit of history, the last time that premium was over 100 basis points was in 2013. Remember the fiscal cliff in 2013 and then the government shutdown? Taper so tantrum. at that time, yeah. there were also fiscal worries ar around. It wasn't so much debt sustainability at the time. I would say it was more political gridlock in, in Washington. Um, but that still creates, you know, in the same way that any other country other than the U.S. would see country risk rise, um, because of political factors, that's what caused it. And, and I think right now, a lot of people are, are, are arguing that, that you're seeing the same situation, right? Where you're seeing, um, excess supply of treasuries, if you will, in the secondary market or a lack of demand for them. Um, because a lot of people are really concerned about the fiscal situation that the U S finds itself in having to, you know, it's the interest expenses. Uh, are rising considerably, they will probably continue to rise further. And so people are worried about debt sustainability. Now, in most developed countries, those kinds of fears are usually short lived. If not, look at Japan. Japan has been having right. these problems for ages. And how much has the 10 year JGB been trading at? Negative or like basically close to zero, right? Um, and so what we find is that when you have these big spikes in the term premium, like what we're seeing today, that often will make for an attractive entry point, especially if what follows, say, the next three to six months is a slowdown. Because um, any kind of lack of demand by investors or households for these bonds because of these worries, I, and mainly institutional investors, I would say, like asset managers or hedge funds, um, would likely be offset by what I was saying, uh, by flight to safety, which is simply not present today, but is usually the driving force behind bond rallies in slowdowns. In 2008, for example, basically all of the drop in the 10 year, uh, especially from the summer of 2008 onwards, was because of safe haven demand. It wasn't because of a shift in expectations around Fed policy. Those had adjusted before. It's really that, and that's a, a, a key ingredient that today uh, is missing. And I think the dynamic is being amplified right now by um, a lot of, especially um, if you look at uh, CFTC data, so um, this would be like uh, net long positions by various trends in the treasury market, especially if you look at uh, treasury futures, um, you'll see that hedge funds in particular are net short by, a, by, a, by an exceptional amount, meaning that there are a lot of them that are betting that the fiscal situation in the U.S. will be unsustainable and the deals will continue um, to rise, kidding, I don't know, 6 7%, kind of like what, what Bill Ackman, for instance, has been worrying um, for a while. 
If you were sure. to ask me, yeah. I think for you to see sustainably yields at, say, above 6%, what would have to happen would be, uh, what our research would suggest is, you, you need to remain in overheating, uh, essentially. So you need to be in a situation where the economy continues to surprise on the upside for a while, inflation expectations rise as fears over inflation reaccelerate, and that forces the Fed to continue raising rates much more aggressively than what the market currently is pricing, right? The market must be pricing. It's either some, I guess, a lot of people expect rates to have already paused and then maybe one more hike, but not more than that. What you would need is the situation where not only do you avoid a downturn, but again, you continue to overheat, which is, which is sort of the worst possible outcome um, for investments in, in treasury debt. If that were to happen, and you strongly, strongly believe that's the case, then yes, absolutely, the price of these bonds could continue going down. But in all likelihood, that's not the case. In all likelihood, yeah. you're going to transition towards uh, something that's a little more sustainable. Um, and, and I think there's a lot, a lot of the signals are already there. It's just that they take a while um, to, to kick in. Uh, for instance, um, one chart that I've been seeing around for a while uh, in, the, in the last little while now is uh, this chart that compares the unemployment rate in the U.S. against um, the term spread, so the 10-year minus three-month, let's say. And there's a strong historical link. But what's interesting about it is that uh, the turning point in the unemployment rate is almost always coincides with the yield curve going from very negative to a little less negative, which is what we're seeing right now. Uh, I can give you a whole bunch of other examples. If you look at, um, there's this really good survey. Um, it's by the uh, National Federation of Independent Businesses, NFIB. They have this thing called the Small right. Business Survey. Um, and there's a, there's a wealth of really interesting data that, that they have there. But the most interesting bit for me are um, uh, hiring expectations by small and medium enterprises, which it's worth remembering make up a much larger share of employment than they make of GDP, right? Because a lot of these um, industries like retail, let's say, or, or, or grocery stores, that sort of thing, um, they're very labor intensive and they, they contribute much more towards employment. Uh, leisure and accommodation, obviously, would be a big example. And if you look at that, uh, that has strong, very strong predictive content over job creation, the unemployment rate, and so on. That points to... Um, you know, the unemployment rate rising at least 50 basis points, at least probably more within within the next six months. So I think the signals yeah. are there. It's just that, you know, um, people in the industry, uh, a lot of strategists, and, and we've been, you know, um, yeah. uh, we've fallen into this trap at times as well. You become excessively anxious about getting a slowdown, right? You, you know, the yield curve inverts and all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah. You know, you need to switch con entirely towards uh, bonds or cash or whatever, just dump the risky stuff. And that's not really the case, right? It takes a long time, uh, potentially, for, you know, adverse shocks to credit or borrowing or so on to actually hit the economy. The link between real interest rates, for instance, rising and, cons and, cons and, and, and consumption growth uh, falling in most developed markets is between 18 months and 24 months. It's not six months, it's not three months, mm -hmm. right? And if, if you go back 24 months ago, real interest rates were really low. They were deep negative still, right? And so it, it, take, it can take a long time for these things to kick in. But if you look at the most sort of trustworthy uh, of these lead, leading indicators, you would, uh, I would say for the most part, find that the timing is very much in line with what we've seen in the past where you know, these leading indicators uh, start signaling red, and then for, for a while, um, risky assets continue doing well, and we're now entering those final stages where, you know, it's not looking that good, and you see a little bit of, of disruption in terms of optimism, at least, right? Look at any survey, the bull bear spread, put call ratios on equities, anything like that, um, we're in a much better position in August than we are today, right? A lot of the sentiment has turned a lot more negative now. And again, that is very much consistent with the late cycle. Yeah. And Joaquin, sorry, I'd, li go I'd ahead. like to maybe push back a little bit uh, on the, uh, the health of the, the treasury market. 
specifically a, a, as it per pertains to supply demand dynamics, we saw the Treasury issue bills uh, to replenish the TGA, uh, which was you know dropped to almost zero in the run up to the government shutdown, uh, possibly providing some cover uh, for quantitative tightening. Yes, we've also we've also seen the Fed, which has been the the eight hundred pound gorilla in that room, uh, retrench. They, they, they've mm -hmm. shifted now. They're, they're natural sellers or, or, or not necessarily sellers, but they're, they're, they're running off the balance sheet and they're, 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 they're allowing, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to reduce as much as they can. They're definitely not net buyers anymore at, at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. banks have had to retrench as well in, mm -hmm. the, in this very, very slow moving banking crisis that had an acute phase in March and then has yeah. since then been, been very sluggish and moving. There seems to be waning uh, international appetite to hold treasuries, even though we we know that the U.S. dollar uh, reserve status remains largely intact, given the structure of global debt and, and the trillions of dollars that have been issued in that currency. But to to, to put this, these things in perspective, would you say that there's actually maybe some good reason for this uh, spike in the term premium because of this this unhealthy situation? On the longer end, I mean, if if Secretary Yellen were to decide to issue duration going forward uh, and and increase the supply, which has been limited uh, to a large degree uh, for anything uh, north of uh, three to five years, uh, really, that could really uh, impose a a a selling pressure, an additional selling pressure, and we could see these uh, term premiums expand even further. It, it, look, it's it's certainly possible. Um, the argument, I think, both with regards to, you know, increasing supply of these treasuries, the Fed not playing ball uh, as they did, as they have done for the last decade. And then in terms of the international aspect, I think the main concern there is Japan. Japan is the largest, uh, I'm pretty sure they're the largest holder. Foreign holder. Foreign holder of U.S. Treasuries. Uh, I don't know how they rank with China, but it's, you know, it, it's a big amount regardless. And then the key concern there is that as the Bank of Japan abandons um, the, the, you know, super unconventional policy stance that they have with the curve control and so on, um, that Japanese uh, investors will want to hold more Japanese government debt relative to U.S. Treasuries, and that will reduce the demand um, for these bonds, which, uh, to, to be fair, I think would be a reversal to a trend decline in the term premium we've seen in the last two decades, right? Because over the last two decades, there has been, for the most part, a continuous growing foreign appetite for U.S. Treasuries. Even, you know, it, this dates back to the mid-90s, I would even say, right, to the Asian financial crisis and there being, you know, um, uh, increased... Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, foreign pension funds, for example, requiring to hold uh, a greater amount of U.S. treasuries, that driving up the demand and and so on. So it's certainly possible for these effects uh, to reverse. Um, all I'm saying is that the biggest factor that causes sudden shifts in the term premium is flight to safety, and that just simply is not present, right? All you have are concerns around these factors that 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 you're mentioning, which are driving up the term premium. And it's very possible that we end up in an equilibrium situation for the term premium that is higher than what we've seen in the last decade. So if that were to happen, you still have to remember that where yields end up is still fundamentally a function of what the Fed does, of what happens to inflation and what happens to growth. That's still fundamentally the case, right? So you could be in a situation where you don't have this excess demand by the rest of the world and you no longer have QE, but you have QT. But if that's accompanied by a situation where the economy slows, the Fed cuts rates, growth expectations fall and inflation expectations fall, you still very likely would be seeing yields below four. That, that's true. Maybe that's another way of, of, of phrasing it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, this... my question, I was going to ask you what you thought the what you thought the probability was of something like Bill Ackman's high for long thesis coming true. I mean, I, I think you explained it to some degree with with the overheating scenario that you don't think will materialize, but what what is the probability of that outcome versus the probability of the outcome that you're 
that you're favoring? The probab- So what we're picking up right now is the probability of yields falling below 4.7 in the right. next 12 months is very high right now. It's about 80%. Um, and that's tied to a very high probability of the economy stagnating and the Fed likely cutting rates more aggressively than what the market is pricing in the first half of next year. So that's all those things are sort of working on the background. Now, I guess what's important here to point out related to your point about Ackman is you can't discard a situation where yields remain above five, which is something that you could have discarded for the most part uh, at any point in the last decade at least, right? It's just that the probability of that happening in a context where the economy slows is low. Um, so it, what you're basically looking at, if you think about it in terms of distributions, is there's an 80% chance that the, that yields will fall below 4.7. But if you look at the right end of that, of the right tail of that distribution, it's still at around six, meaning that you can't discard, like it, it, it remains a low probability scenario, but one that you can't discard, whereas you could have discarded that easily um, at, at any point in time. And so what that means is that because duration risk is present and it's not something you can discard, you probably still want to get creative in terms of how you structure the fixed income portion of your portfolio, right? Uh, so it's not just going long on, you know, fixed income ETF, sole maturity type thing, and then, you know, that's all you do. You probably want to pair with some short-term debt as well. Um, there might be opportunities abroad that you may want to exploit. Uh, we like, for example, uh, uh, some emerging market uh, bonds we like right now, assuming that the world doesn't come to an end in terms of growth, obviously, because that would cause uh, sovereign spreads to rise sharply. But absent that, you, we like that. Um, and then there might be some some tactical your tactical opportunities in the corporate debt space. The corporate debt space has been doing well. Um, you know, high yield. Uh, returns, total returns on high yield bonds have done way better than than those in uh, in, in treasuries. Uh, basically, the spreads have been super tight. Um, as long as the economy keeps chugging along, and then you see you know employment surprising on the upside and these positive economic surprises, as long as that remains, which I think you can argue could remain between now and December, um, then spreads remain low. You get a really high coupon payment on these things right now. And then right. it's it's a good alternative. the The issue becomes, you know, when economic activity really starts deteriorating, what do you do there? Um, and then there's the other argument, you know, do you even look for further alternatives outside of fixed income in that context? Right? Do you do you look at gold? Do you look at commodities? There might be other alternatives out there in terms of of, of um, uh, shielding you or minimizing equity risk in 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 a portfolio, in a situation where the economy experience or developed markets experience something closer to a stagnation or a classic downturn relative to stagflation, I think fixed income in general is an effective macro hedge. If you were to have a situation where that isn't the case and then inflation expectations reaccelerate, then commodities are very much your friends there, um, kind of like what they were they were last year. Uh, and that would resemble more of a 1970s type situation, right? Then, than, than what we think will happen. Well, there seems to be there seems to be some concern that that's what we'll see a re- that we'll see a repeat of that, right? That that you know this is an analog that the 70s analog is is uh, similar to today. Um, I, you probably disagree with that, but I, I, I guess moving on, I want to ask you because based so based on your on your late cycle thesis. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we're at the final stage of an expansionary phase in the economy and and um, your outlook for rates, which is, you know, the million dollar question in your in your research, in your two, uh, one being the U.S. report and the other being the global report, which we'll we'll actually share with the audience mm-hmm. in the show notes. Um, you've provided a detailed breakdown of optimal weights, of course. So this is the next million dollar question is now that we know all, now that we know what you're proposing or what your thesis is on, on, uh, the economy and markets, what, what are the optimal weights for various asset groups and how do you determine those weights and what factors are playing a crucial role in this determination in your research? Well, the choice of weights depends on a wide array of unknowns. Uh, 
uh, or some knowns, but it's essentially a function of risk preferences of your risk profile and your holding period, right? So it, how macro shocks or economic dynamics affect financial markets um, is not the same three months or within the next three months than say six to 12 months into the future or even longer. Um, and then how you position accordingly will also depend on your tolerance for risk relative to minimizing uh, portfolio losses in general. Um, and also, I importantly, the uh, any constraints that you may face as an asset allocator in terms of rotating across assets, right? Because what happens to us is um, we have clients across the investment space. It can range from pension funds to hedge funds. Uh, and then the recommendation is quite different, right? Because I can, a hedge fund may, you know, many of them could find more value in me saying you should be switching very aggressively towards this asset class or completely dumping this other one. But if you're a large mutual fund, if you're a bank, if you're a pension fund, you can't do that, right? You can, you, you, you have these sort of limited constraints that you can uh, decide. But so we work on with sort of these constraints and these uh, factors in mind. Um, the way we uh, will determine the optimal weights is what we do is we forecast um, uh, future returns for a, a whole array of assets. For example, the standard one, let's say, consider a global portfolio made up of uh, stocks and bonds, both in developed and emerging markets. So you would be looking at something like uh, U.S. equities, just plain vanilla, right? Uh, U.S. equities offshore, whether hedge or unhedged. So this would be mainly Europe, Japan, that sort of thing. Then you have EM equities, uh, and then you have uh, U.S. Uh, sovereign debt or corporate debt. Uh, same thing for offshore. And then EM, often it's hard currency that people will invest in. That's a lot more liquid. You could do a little global currency. So the first step when you're working on this probabilistically is what you need to do is you need to forecast returns for all these things, but what's called, you need to do it jointly, meaning that what you need is not just to forecast, hey, where do I see this one asset class, class moving and what is the risk of me making a lot of money or losing a lot of money, but you also want to consider the correlation between these assets. That's really, really important. And the correlation structure or what uh, portfolio managers would call the covariance structure um, <laughs> is subject to uh, a variety of common shocks. Uh, and so that's what we're really interested in controlling for. So when we determine optimal portfolio weights, that is sort of conditional on our own projections that are by themselves back tested on uh, policy rates in the US, in emerging markets, and in uh, major developed markets, long term interest rates, the term structure of interest rates, do uh, the broad dollar index or uh, bilateral currency pairs. Um, and then various measures uh, that are more um, uh, tactical in nature, like uh, fund flows, for example, are things that are important to consider. Uh, things like shifts in volatility or financial stress uh, as well. And then, and then commodity price movements. And then what happens is that not every country or not every, not every asset class will be equally uh, sensitive to these, to these factors, right? So if commodity prices are rising, for example, Depending on what the source of change is behind the surge in commodity prices, typically emerging market assets would benefit more from that. And so to the extent that you're picking up a high probability of this being persistent, then that would tell you, hey, you should be considering a higher weight. And then once you sort of have this sort of massive matrix that considers these macro factors, some more um, perhaps um, uh, like sector market specific dynamics, like liquidity flows, for example, uh, valuations are important and so on. Um, you forecast these uh, joint distributions and then you find uh, the weights that maximize the risk reward trade off for the entire portfolio for a given set, for a given holding period, and for a given degree of risk tolerance. And so we usually will choose, um, you know, uh, the amount, you know, the risk tolerance that we choose as an average is what gives you on average a 60-40 breakdown. Um, and so for what we're seeing right now is a situation where for that risk preference, if you're investing beyond the very near term, so beyond the next three months, 
you should be considering, as I was saying before, a more conservative tilt. From a global standpoint, um, we like, so in terms of geographic diversification, we like uh, still the U.S. more than we would like a lot of offshore assets. Part of that is that in a context of a global slowdown, the dollar will strengthen. And so when that happens, as it's happening today, that really erodes the appeal of international uh, investments on hedge ones in particular. Uh, part of the reason why European assets have been doing poorly, for instance, has been because of that recently, because the euro started to weaken again against the dollar after a fairly lengthy period of appreciation. Um, and then what I think is really important is that we also find important differences and uh, uh, opportunities for alpha in terms of country rotation as well both within developed markets as well as within emerging markets. So within developed markets, for instance, yes, in general, we like U.S. more than offshore because as flight to safety kicks in, typically the U.S. will, will benefit from that rel in relative terms at least. Um, but then even outside of the U.S., there are very large differences primarily between Europe and the rest of Europe and in particular between the Eurozone specifically and the rest of the world. So. While we are in general underweight international equities, uh, that's mainly because we really dislike uh, Eurozone assets. Uh, we've sort of been pushing for this for a while, uh, for a little while now, at least since the summer, and that tur that's turning out to do really well. Uh, we were really concerned about Germany, for example, recently. Um, and then, you know, we started suggesting you should really reduce your exposure or if you can short, consider that. Uh, and that's been doing well. Um, conversely, the, the three regions that we like, uh, still outside of the U S Japan is the one we like the most, uh, Japan has a very different structure to the rest of the developed world. It has more of an sort of idiosyncratic component, if you will, uh, benefiting from supportive corporate policy. I think that's a big factor right now. You have a uh, strong dividend growth, you have share buybacks, things that are supportive. Uh, to returns. The Japanese economy is in an earlier stage of the economic cycle, so it's actually expanding as opposed to being in the late cycle, which is beneficial. And if the Bank of Japan is a little less dovish, then that would likely mean that the yen will appreciate and that would benefit investments in Japan. So we like Japan. We like Australia uh, as well, basically because it's tied to our view on emerging markets. Uh, we think that the market is excessively pessimistic on China, at least cyclically. Uh, there is some degree of liquidity support where there really isn't any uh, in developed markets. The country in the, the developed market that benefits the most from that typically is Australia because of their strong bilateral relationships with Japan, uh, with China, excuse me. And then we also like an asset a region that really has been completely ignored by everyone for the last decade, which is the UK. The UK is, you know, such, it's been completely abandoned by the investment by the investor community since the Scottish referendum, I would say in 2014, I think for good reason, there was a lot of little risk, but it's now there's a valuation aspect here. It's so cheap right now. You know, it's, it's probably the cheapest uh, region you can look at, uh, with a high degree of liquidity, maybe <laughs> stuff in Latin America as well, but it trades at Latin American valuations, you know, a, a country that really shouldn't. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, too cheap relative to where economic conditions was would point moving forward. And it also has a much stronger defensive component than the Eurozone. And so there's, a, there's an opportunity there uh, as well. And so, again, yes, we're a little more bearish as, as you share the research. People will see in the Global Asset Allocation Report, we have a country, uh, country rotation table. And you'll see that, yes, we're underweight offshore assets, but that's really very concentrated in the Eurozone. Elsewhere, you know, we do see some opportunities. And it's a similar type of story with emerging markets where um, we're neutral to slightly overweight six to 12 months out. There is a risk that the global economy experiences a significant, you know, a, a significant slowdown that wouldn't be good for emerging markets. The big factor there, I would say, is that if you were to get a slowdown or, or, or a fairly aggressive recession, it would not have to do with anything that emerging markets are doing. It would stem from developed markets. And when that happens, usually the, the drawdowns are shortly. It's really when the drawdowns and uh, when, when the crisis is stemming from emerging markets, then you don't want to hold them. 
Uh, the classic example would be 1997. Uh, in Asia, 2001, Argentina, 98, Russia, 94, Mexico, that sort of thing is really adverse. We don't see that happening right now. It's more like China is slowly tapering out and slowly dying out type of thing, but that's not, you know, a significant crisis in its own right. Uh, so we do see opportunities there. Um, and then within that region, we still remain confident that South America has probably the strongest opportunities uh, within that space cyclically, uh, primarily because they were the most effective at handling inflation uh, post-pandemic in terms of they're being really aggressive with their hikes and that giving them a lot of leeway in terms of policy support. Brazil is the, 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 the best case uh, um, there, right, where the BCB raised rates really, really aggressively in 2021 to have real interest rates at plus seven, plus eight, when everybody else had negative rates. And right now, you know, it, it compressed valuations, they're really cheap, and they're now pivoting. There is a risk that the rail will depreciate uh, when you do that, so maybe going hedged is the better uh, idea. But there is, you know, a cyclical opportunity there, I would say, uh, clearly tied to, you know, China rebounding or not. But um, even if it doesn't, Brazil is an energy exporter, uh, and so they should be able to, to benefit from uh, the current upswing that we've seen in, in, in oil prices, like any other petro asset, uh, there. So we, 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 we still continue to like South America, uh, combination of macro and valuations there. Uh, and then the rest is a little, uh, you know, it's a little more hit and miss that Asia were neutral, but that hides big, big differences, uh, across that landscape, um, there's some regions we like. We are starting to like India again. Um, we are worried at some point because of the potential compression valuations, but signals tend to be favorable there. Um, we think again that the market is being pessimistic on China. Uh, we really don't like Taiwan. We really don't like South Korea for the same reason that we don't like something uh, It's just way too overstretched. Uh, so again, it's, it's really important in positioning in the lead cycle. And especially as you enter a downturn to pick your winners and your losers well. Um, and so, you know, yes, the most important determinant is getting the 60-40 mix right. You, you shift one way or the other. But then there's a whole array of different things that you can do in terms of style, in terms of country rotation, uh, in terms of adding you know, commodity exposure, for instance. There are a lot of things that you can do to really uh, enhance the upside of your portfolio or minimize potential losses above and beyond just simply getting the, the, the yield story right, which I agree with you is the most important thing to need to decide. To, to take a step back from the regional and country-specific calls, but to rather think a little bit more about the framework you're describing, early on, as you were going through the allocation mix and the way you guys think about this, it sounded like you were describing some form of either mean variance optimization or perhaps a black litter, right? You're, you're, you're looking at the covariance matrix and you're looking at uh, the, the correlations and perhaps the volatility. One of the things that we've learned is uh, these these approaches are very sensitive to the inputs. And so there's so much noise in all of these variables, but primarily they are subject to you know recency bias and for a potential inflection point when it comes to regime shifts. One of the things that we saw in 2022 was this wake up call or a potential for a wake up call. It's it, 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 it's clearly uh, been somewhat uh, uh, muted by the rally that we saw in equities in 2023 year to date. But it, it was definitely a wake up call to see stocks and bonds fall mm -hmm. together so uh, precipitously in the first half of last year, which calls into question this whole idea that, you know, all you need is is stocks and bonds in some correct combination, perhaps geographically uh, well diversified. So I guess what I'm trying to get is, is when you consider that 2022 might have been uh, uh, the beginning of an inflection when it comes to regime shift, and we have been very long in the two, 40 years, mm -hmm. give or take, on what has been the best, by far best period to own a 60-40, US 60-40, that is, uh, portfolio. How would you think about incorporating that scenario when you have stocks and bonds highly correlated and potentially drawing down at the same time? We can get into a little bit of the specifics on, on why inflation expectations 
might uh, continue to rise. We see core uh, well anchored, but headline inflation uh, yeah. s starting to show a little bit more signs that, uh, especially when it comes to everything that's going on in the Middle East and the potential for, for crude oil to, to, to remain a problem. So if, as energy goes, so does inflation, uh, especially on the headline side of things. How would you think about outside of just stocks and bonds? And I don't know if you guys do uh, make recommendations when it comes to styles, whether it's global macro, what do you look at long short? You, would you look at CTAs? How would you try to complement a stock bond portfolio of whatever weight across the two main asset classes when it comes to considering a, a, a some form of paradigm shift? Absolutely. So going back to what you were describing initially, yes. Uh, What's important to understand is that the correlation between these things, between asset classes, stocks and bonds being the most tracked, is um, what people like me like to refer as time varying, in the sense that it's sensitive to shifts, to, to, to regime shifts. And we explicitly attempt to accommodate this by uh, mapping, again, if you're able to get specifically for the U.S. where you can get a lot of history and so build models that start in the 1970s or even earlier, um, if you're able to anticipate the probability of you shifting towards something that hasn't been common in the last two decades but did occur before, like stagflation risk, then that will tell you, and in fact it, it, it did tell us uh, with our framework in 2021, that you should start considering things above and beyond the stock bond breakdown because yes, even if, so for example, in mid 2021, we were picking up a very high probability that you were gonna either have overheating from reflation, either overheating or stagflation. That told us that you should go, you should short bonds, but then from an asset allocation standpoint, you should remain marginally overweight equities again because bonds do really poorly. But that was not the final solution because you know, equities were still, they had by themselves a really bad risk reward trade off. And so at that point, it's absolutely the case that you need to start considering um, adding alternatives to that structure. At that time, we found, as you were saying, some hedge fund strategies like the ones you were describing added uh, alpha into the portfolio considerably. Uh, and then specifically, we found because there was a high risk that markets were underpricing inflation risk, that the most effective approach was to effect, essentially entirely replace fixed income assets, standard traditional fixed income assets for a commodity exposure. Now, the risk there is that if you track um, pure commodity indices like the Bloomberg Commodity Index or the S&P GSCI, things of that nature, um, you are ex if you get that signal wrong, you're going to lose a lot of money right? Because they're really volatile. And then if you don't end up having high inflation, then those assets will do really, really poorly. So what we found was that some mix of um, uh, standard commodity index, which is often very heavily tilted towards uh, energy, energy plus gold, the combo of those two things with some hedge fund, some long short hedge fund strategies were effective uh, in diversifying equity risk. What we're picking up right now specifically is because we think that we're sh shifting towards something that is closer to stagnation and and or a classic downturn, bonds, their ability to hedge macro risk improves noticeably relative to what we saw in 2021. Now, you're absolutely true. Like our standard recommendation is within the space of the 60-40. If anything, because the majority especially your clients, you know, pension funds and, and large banks and so on. That's, that's often their sandbox. the space that they work on. Mm -hmm. But we do have a lot of clients who are even more interested, say, in our views on commodities or things that they can add to their structure. And we even rerun alternative portfolios that will include these other categories. And then what you often find, and then what that's absolutely the case in 2021, is that adding these things noticeably improve expected the expected risk reward trade-off and by what i mean by that is the um it, it significantly minimized both the likelihood of losing money in a portfolio and the expected loss on that portfolio because you were replacing something that had a strong correlation that was stocks and bonds in 2022 and stagflation overheating 
for something that did actually give you um, give you diversification. If you were to ask me today, uh, we are still recommending um, going long on certain commodities, especially to options. The reason why we're doing this in part is because uh, you still have considerable backwardation in most commodity markets. And so going long on these, say without the money calls or something like that, has a very strong expected gain. Positive because, carry. I'm sorry? The positive carry that you accrue by being long. Uh, yes, these that, that's hurdles. exactly it. Yes, especially because, um, well, again, you have this deep backwardation. And in most commodity markets, when, when you look at the, the supply demand structure right now, there is, and I'm not the first one to talk about this. This has been out there for a while. There is There are these very persistent supply shortages that have been building up for a decade or more. Uh, the clearest example of that is in crude oil, uh, or the most popular example where n not only do you have very low shale supply, but you also have a high incentive for OPEC plus to cut supply. And so that creates a shortfall, uh, a lack of CapEx in North America, in North American shale in particular, I think puts a floor on how much the supply demand balance could erode and therefore the downside risk on commodities. And you have a not so dissimilar dynamic in industrial metals in South America, where you've had a fairly long period of a lack of mining investment uh, in copper. Uh, in Chile and Peru, there were a lot of, um, you know, again, the price was simply not high enough to justify investment for a while. There were also strikes, uh, mainly in Peru, that also held back mining supply as well. And then in Brazil, uh, the iron ore market has been basically facing significant supply shortfalls for uh, four or five years now. There was this big dam disaster uh, in Brazil in, in one of the largest mines there uh, by the world's largest producer of iron ore. Uh, and that simply has not come back. And what that does is it, it limits downside risk, even in a situation where demand were to, or demand expectations were to weaken um, because of concerns around Chinese real estate, for example. Right? And so it's that lack of supply that, that translates into a high probability of being able to execute these at the money calls in uh, industrial metals and energy in particular, uh, even if demand were to weaken somewhat. It's just the market is simply too pessimistic there. And so going along with that can translate into very strong returns. Again, the, the, the issue with that is it go, go boils down to risk preference as well is um, how do you size this in terms of positions, right? Uh, options are, are much riskier than anything long only 60-40. And so I can tell you, hey, look, there's a strong probability that, that you will execute, um, you know, if you buy a May 2024 Brent call option, you can make 70%, 80%. But if you get that wrong, you'd be losing a lot more than you would lose with bonds. And so from a, from, a, from a sizing standpoint, that's sort of the key challenge there. But I do think that there are opportunities that you could exploit uh, in that space because, I, again, for the most part, we don't find that commodity futures are correctly pricing um, these dynamics that I'm describing. To potential scarcity, yeah. I, yeah. I guess that what you're describing uh, in terms of potentially using options would suggest instead of using naked options, using uh, call spreads uh, yes. and then potentially selling an out of the money put or, or something to that effect in order to, to, to cheapen uh, that structure. And, and, and maybe it is useful for, for the viewers and listeners uh, to just kind of quickly explain what a backward-dated market is. I mean, we're, we're all uh, kind of deeply... Uh, familiar with all this stuff, but it's it, it's essentially when the near term contract is more expensive than the contracts that are further out on what's called the term structure, right? That that futures term structure. Uh, and so it's an inverted. So typically a contango market is upward sloping, and then a backward data market is a downward sloping uh, uh, term structure for, for exactly. any commodity. And, and I would add that what's really important when you're, um, when you're investing or trading in that space, um, it's not just where you think, it's not just if you think that the price of the commodity, this can be for anything. Right? It could be for the price of a bond or it could be for rates. It's not just you determining whether it's going to go up or down. It's 
the likelihood of it going up or down relative to what the market is pricing at the maturity date that you're looking to invest. So let's say that you want to buy a 12-month call option, so something that would expire in October of next year. Um, you're playing against the 12-month contract, which could be trading at a lower price, as Richard was saying, than the spot price today. And so what you're basically betting is the market having some kind of an adjustment towards where you think things should be priced 12 months into the future, right? And because the market moves rapidly and expectations shift quickly, you could see those shifts very, very quickly, very, very rapidly. And so it's that gap that you're basically playing. It's the gap between your own expectation as an investor um, and what the market is pricing. That's essentially what you're playing. It's the exact same thing if you were to invest in in um, in rate futures, for example. So if you were to say, if you think that the market is excessively hawkish uh, on Fed policy, then one, you could go long on Fed funds futures, for instance, basically playing the gap between where markets expect rates to be, policy rates, that is to be, say, six months from now and where you think they will be. So usually mar uh, futures markets are in contango, as Richard is saying. Right now, most commodity markets are backward dating, are, are backward dated. And so to the extent that you think they're excessively pessimistic, it's that feature that you're exploiting to try and make money off. And this is the core rationale, uh, what you were just describing, this probability adjusted approach to asset allocation and to, to scenario construction is essentially what this Bayesian approach that you uh, referred to very early on in the conversation. This is essentially what we're talking about, right? This, this, this being able to adjust your the outcomes that you're envisioning based on the shifts in near term expectations and exactly. adjusting your scenario accordingly. Exactly. and. Yep. That's it. And monitoring how that probability evolves over time to decide whether there is actually an opportunity or, you know, you may believe something is there when in fact it's excessively risky. The likelihood of you making money or, or making a lot of money uh, is simply not there relative to some other alternative positioning. And so, again, the whole point of this is that all of us, none of us have a crystal ball, right? We all face an incredible amount of uncertainty when making uh, investment or asset allocation decisions. And so the best you can do is monitor how the likelihood of certain scenarios are evolving. And even better, when you play in the futures market, comparing you know, the likelihood of being able to execute certain positions is something that you can do as well. Uh, and off that, decide whether you should, um, you know, whether there is actually an opportunity to try and uh, at the very, like, again, if you're just using these alternative instruments from a, from a hedging standpoint or as a replacement to bonds or something like that, whether there is actually an opportunity to do so uh, rather than staying in the tradition, the more traditional camp. What is priced yeah. in essentially? Because at the end of the day, in our, in our world, you can get the call right, but lose money if things were already fully priced in and maybe yeah. beyond priced in uh, to the scenario that you're, you're, you're getting right. Uh, I, I wonder if we might touch on inflation a little yeah. bit and get a, a little bit more into the specifics of inflation because that is so crucial in determining uh, the conversation we were having just before uh, we went live, which is essentially the path of longer term interest yeah. rates. Uh, in the right. U.S., and then obviously uh, as it pertains to how that spills over to other uh, sovereign debt instruments. So after we've had, well, you and I spoke to a, in a different podcast a couple months ago, and, mm -hmm. and it, it seemed like the, the, the balance between inflationistas uh, and, and, and those that thought that inflation had already peaked was somewhat pending towards uh, deflation. Uh, and then in the last couple of CPI prints, we've seen headline inflation a bit above uh -huh. what was uh, originally expected. Again, energy playing an important role. Uh, there were some additional pressures from the service side of things. How do you see that balance today uh, as it pertains to, to, to this, this crucial uh, uh, variable? Yeah, so in general, people tend to disregard um, movements in energy prices and, and, and how they affect inflation because they're perceived as entirely supply side driven and therefore not really having an incidence on how central banks will react because obviously central banks affect demand, they don't affect supply. And so they tend to ignore these things. 
And I agree with that with the direct effect in the sense that if the price of oil rises and then that causes gasoline prices to rise, then obviously it's going to have an immediate impact on inflation. I think what is not discussed as much, and this is a bigger source of concern to me, is that rising energy prices can affect near-term inflation expectations by both consumers and firms, right? They can affect the psyche of how people think about inflation, especially businesses. And if that happens, then you can have a self-fulfilling prophecy where inflation expectations start picking up. If you look at the latest survey um, of consumers by the University of Michigan, one year ahead inflation expectations did actually go up quite a bit. Uh, they went up from 3.2 or 3.3 to 3.8, which is high. Um, and, and that, I think, is, is very much strongly linked to uh, rising oil prices. And so that, that's a channel that I'm a little worried about in the sense that you don't want to get that out of hand, right? And so to the extent that economic activity remains resilient, that would probably uh, uh, disincentivize the Fed from at least cutting rates um, too fast. So one source of concern, again, is near-term inflation expectations rising because of that. The good news there, I don't know if you've seen how gasoline prices and the price of uh, refined petroleum products have evolved in the last two weeks, but they've fallen off a cliff, big time. Um, the, the price of, uh, so RBOV gasoline prices, for instance, which are spot prices, uh, the trade in, in, you know, it's uh, gasoline as it trades in the Gulf Coast or in the New York Harbor or Los Angeles, they, they're down like 30% since mid-September, something like that. And that, yeah. I think, is to do with two things. You have demand destruction, um, uh, people observing prices being really high and gasoline demand falling. It fell like 11% in September, if you look at the weekly data from the EIA. And then the other thing is you had um, refinery uh, unplanned outages throughout the summer uh, in the Gulf Coast and the East Coast, uh, and that created a significant supply shortfall. You even had that even more in diesel. Diesel affects more PPI than CPI. Just for those that, that don't know, diesel would be used more in industrial applications and transport and uh, like things like trucking than would on, right. on, on car and like, you know, <laughs> light vehicles. And so it doesn't really affect CPI that much, but it does PPI quite a bit. Um, those are falling basically because availability is starting to rise again. And so I think one thing to monitor uh, in, the, in the energy uh, aspect is there being a reversal in this dynamic as consumers no longer observe, you know, prices at the pump at three bucks a gallon or something, but more at two bucks a gallon. And if that happens, then you could have a, a downward reversal. So that's that I think is something worth monitoring. And so it's very possible that you're going to have a lower CPI print in October than you will in September because of that. Um, the, 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 um, the bigger question right now, and, and one that is very difficult to answer is what happens to shelter. Shelter is the biggest component of the consumer basket, uh, in most developed markets. That's certainly the case in the U S rule of thumb. You can split CPI between three. You have, uh, goods, uh, shelter and other services. That's essentially it. Um, gas, uh, energy is mainly goods. There's a bit of, you know, heating and so on, but, uh, shelter alone is a third of the consumer basket. Housing prices started falling, uh, in the second half of last year and housing prices lead rental inflation, which is what enters the consumer basket directly by between nine to 12 months, usually rough. So. They fell in the second half of last year, and so it made sense for shelter inflation to dissipate a little bit earlier this year. Um, but then they, they, then they bottomed out, and then they started rising again. Why? Because there's no supply. There's no supply of homes. Um, and so because there's no availability of homes, then all of a sudden the, 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 the housing market remained really tight, and even if there was no marginal demand for homes because mortgage rates are really high, there's also no supply of homes because no one's building. Uh, sorry, it's right. It's not that no one's building. People are building. There's no resale activity. No one's putting their house in the market because why would you, right? Why would you mortgage rates. give up yeah. a two not in the US mortgage, anyway. <laughs> a nine percent mortgage or something like that, right? Yeah. And so um, that's what's happening right now. Because there's no availability, you've seen single family home prices in the US, which are the biggest um, type of home, it's the, 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 the biggest component, I guess, uh, within uh, shelter inflation. That's been rising.
uh, consistently since January all the way through August. I think if you look at high-frequency data uh, or you know, the, the K-Shiller index uh, lags a little bit, but you can look at alternative indicators, um, that's been rising. And that is the dynamic I'm much more concerned about because if you can't bring that down, that's a big, 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 big portion of CPI. And so that's the one I would, I would take a look at uh, much more. The good news is that, um, from an inflationary standpoint at least, you are seeing some signs that construction activity is rising. Uh, there have been delays in construction, a lot of them tied to logistical disruptions throughout the pandemic, which have pushed back uh, the time it takes to build homes. That's starting to rise right. uh, somewhat. And so that would point, we think, to uh, um, less tightness in the single family home market. And so chances are that that would diminish a little bit these inflationary pressures. But I think that's where the Fed has an issue because they have absolutely no control over that, right? If it were only due to demand um, for new homes, housing prices should have tanked, but they didn't. Um, it's more to do with the structure of the mortgage market right now, right? In the U.S., you have 30-year fixed. You don't see that in Canada, for instance, right? In Canada, right. the average would be um, would be five-year uh, interest rates that you then renegotiate through a, what, 25-year period? I think it's it's usually 20 to 25-year period. And so you have a lot more uh, variability there. In the U.S., you just simply don't. And so there is literally no supply at all. And that's not something that the Fed can fix. It's more like an institutional thing, right? It's more, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's more to do with banking regulation, perhaps, or something that the Treasury or, or the, 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 the fiscal side of the government could address much more so than, 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 than what the Fed could do. That, that has nothing to do with demand. In fact, mortgage applications, again, they dropped, I can't remember the exact number, but were, it, it, at least 60%, 60, 70% uh, last year. There's just simply no demand. Um, but, but again, uh, there's no inventories. And so as long as there's no inventories, then prices are going to remain high. Um, so if, right. And, and so, as you said, uh, Joaquin, I mean, there's no, there's no supply of homes coming on the market, not much of a supply of homes coming on the market for resale, but that's causing, that's causing a, um, displacement on the, uh, home construction side, Yeah. right. Where, where you see a lot of demand for new homes from prospective home buyers. And again, that's not moving the needle on the mortgage market because the mortgages don't come, don't apply until the house is, is until completion. Exactly. Right. So if, if a home is, if a home takes six months to two years to build, uh, depending on the home builder, I don't, you know, whatever that, that, that lag is, the, the mortgage demand for those new homes doesn't come, doesn't apply until those homes are, are built. And, so you're not, that's where you're, you're not, you know, even though there is that construction activity, you're not seeing it in the mortgage market yet. That, that's exactly it. Yeah. And so when you piece all of this together, I, I'd say maybe the final piece of the puzzle would be wage growth. Um, wage growth is a really important determinant of other services, which would be that, that remaining third uh, of the consumer basket. Um, it was rising, obviously, really, really, uh, really rapidly throughout much of last year. That's tied to the fact that you have uh, an incredibly tight job market. By that, I mean not just strong job creation, but a lot of vacancies and, you know, like basically um, that ratio between vacancies and, and unemployment being really high, right? So there's, there's a, you know, not many people competing uh, for, for a wide array of jobs. And so that sort of makes it easier to negotiate wages. Um, as hiring slows down, you will likely see that decelerate somewhat. Um, and so we would expect service act shelter inflation to decelerate, but probably remain above target as long as these supply shortages were to remain. Uh, and, and that, that translates in turn into a high probability that inflation um, remains at least, you know, maybe not aggressively above target, but, you know, in that three to three and a half percent range in the next 12 months, which would make for a fairly peculiar slowdown. If you think that the economy will slow down, we're not talking 1970s here, but you are talking about a situation of below trend, perhaps negative growth accompanied by still 
above trend or at least marginally above trend inflation because of these factors um, that that we're describing. Uh, Stagflation right? light, if you yeah, will. Yeah, something like that, like yeah. a light, like a light version, um, like a light version of stagflation. It's it's obviously nowhere near uh, where we were in the seventies. Um, for the biggest reason for that is that inflation expectations are still reasonably anchored, right? And so it's you, inflation is is a lot less volatile when that happens because you you don't see these big big moves and big swings in service inflation, which is what you had um, in the in the nineteen seventies, which was basically a free for all. Uh, you, you you're not there, uh, right? In the nineteen seventies, uh, one year ahead inflation expectations in nineteen seventy eight, for example, which is when the survey starts, was double digits. It was like fifteen percent or more. Um, and so yeah. that creates a really disruptive situation where you observe, you know, you think that inflation will be 15, you're a business, then you raise your prices by 20 because <laughs> chances are you're not going to be able to adjust in the, you know, you want to protect your profits or your revenues in that, um, your profits really in that in between adjustment period, if you're say an insurance company or a healthcare provider or something like that, and then that just creates a lot more inflation. Uh, we're, we're just simply not there yet. The vicious cycle that I saw in Brazil, you saw in Argentina, but that the developed world has yet to uh, see yeah. in this uh, in this generation. I wouldn't, hey, well, I wouldn't you, fully yeah. discard it for Europe, fully. Because uh, with Europe, the issue you have, just very briefly commenting on this, is uh, um, the structure of Europe's job market uh, is uh, very rigid. And what ends up happening is that in Europe, um, you know, about 90, so in the years of about 90% of, of all wages are negotiated, the front of collective bargaining agreements. And basically what ends up happening there is that inflation leads wage growth, which you don't see in North America. And so if you see inflation at five, wages will be adjusted more than five, which then drives up service inflation more than five, which then creates, again, a vicious cycle, what people call a wage price spiral. That's much more. In fact, there are, there's evidence that's happening in Europe. You you just don't get that in North America, where you have a flexible, flexible contracts. What uh, what what do you think is the probability of? Uh, I mean, it's it's very soon that you know it's too it might be too soon to tell. But with the Israel Hamas conflict, um, what what uh, effects might that shock? You know, is there a possibility of a shock in the region? Yeah. Do you see, I mean, do you have a probability on that? And, and what do you think so, might happen with, uh, with that, you know, with that conflict? Yeah. So look, I, with I, regards to energy specifically, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. I, I want to be, yeah. for something like that, I think it's, um, it's easier to be qualitative about it. Um, people like me are often under pressure to give a view on geopolitics. It, it's a very complicated uh, right. issue, right? You need to know a lot about international relations and specifically about the Middle East to have some sense of to what's to happen. So I think the best we can do in terms of under, I think there's two channels that, that, that are at play here. The, the most important one, as you mentioned, is energy. There's a geopolitical risk aspect in general. Um, we right. looked at that. Um, it, we did quite a bit of work of that uh, on that specifically when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine in the in February of last year. Uh, and what we found is that for that to have a big disruptive impact on markets, a pure geopolitical shock or a geopolitical threat like Russia prepping to invade Ukraine, um, you had to have a massive shock, like talking like a World War II type situation, for it to really, really move the needle. So. I don't think that's, you know, that channel I would, unless it were to scale up to something that it becomes regional and, and maybe even involves bigger uh, parties, uh, I wouldn't, you know, pay too much attention to that channel. The energy aspect there, I think the best we can do is go back to past conflicts um, and look at past events and see what happened. Uh, and, and I would, um, discussing this with my energy analyst, that there are three sort of events that I think are worth looking at when thinking about future implications. The um, obvious one would be uh, the 1973 uh, Yom Kippur War. Um, right. Then you had, which was the, the sort of big first oil spike. Uh, the price of oil uh, tripled or more uh, within the span of a few months uh, following that conflict. The other one that I think is really relevant is the Gulf uh, War in the fall of 1990, 
Um, and then the third event is the second, uh, I think it's called the second Lebanese war. This is 2006, the Israeli Lebanon conflict in 2006 with right. Hezbollah. Um, and the implications were really different. Just briefly describing it here. 1973, you had oil prices triple. They remained at really high levels. That eventually triggered speculation in developed markets. In the U.S., it was a big problem. The U.S. was a huge oil importer at the time. You didn't have strategic petroleum reserves. You didn't have anything. And so that was hugely disrupted. Um, but part of the reason that was disruptive is that you had a persistent drop in oil supply. If you look at global oil supply between 73 and 75, it fell very sharply. There was no offsetting force. Uh, it got really, really disruptive there. In 1990, uh, Iraq and Kuwait accounted for a big chunk of OPEC supply. Uh, their production fell almost to zero uh, between the fall of 1990 and, say, January or February 91. Um, but that was very rapidly offset by Saudi Arabia ramping up supply to more than compensate, actually, for that decline. So what you got was a big spike in oil initially. Uh, oil doubled uh, in the third and fourth quarter of 1990. By March of 91, it was back to pre-war levels. And the reason why that was the case is because you, you didn't have a supply shortage that lasted long at all. And then 2006... Um, no major oil producer was really involved, at least directly, uh, in the conflict. And so there was no physical disruption to supply, nor was the supply of oil through the Strait of Hormuz, which is about 70 or 18 million barrels per day that flow through that. It's basically the, the world's largest uh, channel through which oil flows. Uh, right. And that wasn't disruptive either. And so what you had basically was no impact on the oil market at all, right? Israel itself produces... Uh, very little. It produces 300,000 barrels, something like that, of oil. So it, it, it wouldn't affect that. The only, and so if you if you think about what happened with past events, really the question is, will there be sanctions imposed on Iran uh, if they find right. that Iran will be, you know, somewhat, you know, involved to some extent there? The, now again, I'm not a geopolitical expert, so I have no idea if they're going to do that. I would argue that, you know, the incentive to impose sanctions by the U.S. after the U.S. sold a bunch of strategic petroleum reserves last year to avoid having inflation is probably lower than in a normal circumstance from, you know, especially the domestic the election, standpoint, especially heading into election year. Right. So right. the incentive there is just not that high. Then the other thing that I think is important to consider here is that. Saudi Arabia right now, and OPEC in general, but mainly Saudi Arabia, has so much excess capacity at the moment. They're basically producing very, they're producing very, very little relative to what they can produce. Uh, OPEC in general, I think, has an excess. So um, the supply uh, excess capacity basically is about it's more than four million barrels per day. Uh, just to give you some sense, Iran produces about 2.5 million barrels per day. So even if production in Iran were fully disrupted, there would still be a big um, you know, window by which OPEC could potentially compensate for, right. for that. Again, the incentive for them to compensate, who's to say? That's up to the geopolitical experts. But our point, the, the point is that, again, unless... Supply in Iran is heavily disruptive, and OPEC simply does not offset that, kind of like what happened in 73, that would be a similar situation. I, you're looking more, it's, it's probably going to be either a combination of either a transitory shock um, or, or, or basically something that doesn't really have much of an impact on uh, markets beyond the very near term. I think beyond the very near term, we've even seen some of the effects, right? We've seen, say, the 10-year move from 4.9 to 4.7, that's probably a little bit of flight to safety because of that sort of geopolitical risk premium. So you're already seeing a little bit of that, but um, right. Again, it, it really the you know you'd have to it, it's it's the removal of two and a half million barrels of oil from the market if there were sanctions imposed that would be the big uh, disruptive disruptor there. If you were to have that, then obviously that would be highly inflationary. In fact, highly stagflationary. That's what it would be. But but that's the only scenario, qualitatively at least, that I can see it playing um, a, a big, big incidence on on markets beyond the very near term. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, that's <laughs> very comprehensive. Yeah. Uh, Joaquin, what are some uh, what are some emerging trends or areas in finance 
uh, or investment that you're currently excited about or, or that you're researching? Well, in my space, which is, as Richard was describing, the quantum mental side, I think there is uh, interesting work that systematic funds, I think, are starting to conduct now. Um, I, I get a little worried often about that, you know, excessive interest in AI and machine learning without the human touch. Um, we're seeing that right. some uh, systematic funds are attempting to build in this sort of quantum mental approach, which, again, it depends how you do it. A lot of people do this bottom up in the sense that they'll use um, uh, signaling models, uh, kind of like what high frequency traders would use alongside the inputs of, say, equity analysts for specific shops, right, individual stocks, that sort of thing. Um, I'm talking more on the macro side. We're starting to see uh, a little more of that sort of hybrid approach where people are valuing um, what sort of signals, you quantitative signals you can get, but with an attempt to build on, um, you know, a, you know, more quality, Perhaps the word isn't qualitative views on the market, but things that pure AI models may not be able to, to, to capture. And that is something that when we first started doing this was incredibly rare. Uh, luckily, uh, our clients haven't, excuse me, our competition hasn't realized that this is a trend. And so they're not doing that. Uh, so that's good for us. But we yeah. are noticing a lot of interest on, on, uh, in terms of um, funds starting to, to operate uh, in that context. And I don't think this is born out of anything. I think it's born out of macro risk playing so much more of a, of a role uh, in the last year and a half in, in affecting markets, like it, it, it affecting the performance of portfolios, not being able to diversify, you know, um, stock picking, not really being very effective in that space. There being more of an interest uh, in entering uh, that field. Uh, and so I am really sort of, I'm hoping that what will emerge from this is, you know, pure AI, pure machine learning. It is, you know, you can get a lot of, uh, of insights from this, but let's not disregard the human touch here. And let's not disregard what we can learn from past experience, from what, you know, communication we're getting from policymakers, uh, from other investors and so on. Let's not disregard those, those, um, those dynamics. So, Again, I'm yeah. obviously a little biased because that's sort of the world I live in. And so we look at macro stuff. We look at, you know, trends and systematic, uh, as well as, as, as discretionary portfolio management. And we're seeing sort of, um, um, more interest by systematic funds in adopting some more discretionary techniques and by discretionary funds, believe it or not, also trying to embed some more systematic stuff as well, because I think they realize that. Uh, if they don't do that, you may end up, you know, uh, losing out uh, potentially on, on, on a lot <laughs> of behind. Uh, that, that I think the else that, that, that I think is, is starting to emerge. I don't know if you guys would yeah. see this as well on your end. Well, the, the common, the common thread is the domain knowledge, right? I mean, I think it applies to both generative AI and, and machine learning. Yeah. I mean, you have to, especially on the machine learning side, you do have to bring your domain knowledge to the machine learning uh, approach. On the generative side, um, you definitely need domain knowledge experts within a, you know, if it's your firm to review the generative yeah. stuff that, that, you know, that AI is actually producing in terms of an output. Uh, you know, if, if anything, the generative AI needs, needs an enormous amount of, of review because there's a lot of hallucination. Right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, chat, chat GPT, for example, makes things up when it can't find the answer within the language model. And, and so you do need somebody who does know exactly what's correct and what's yeah. not to go through it and make sure that it's not, you know, it's not creating some broad illusion out of, out of nothing. And, and, uh, you know, and, and so one mistake could cost you dearly one, one miss. Or, or, or you, you know, of of that generative AI hallucination that can happen. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you get yeah, the, the could, signal, you know, you may get a really strong signal, and that signal may be completely incorrect. Then you you have a huge problem. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you could ask AI, you could ask ChatGPT, obviously, to write a paper, but if you don't know what the paper is actually, if you don't have the domain knowledge about the paper, or you didn't, you didn't do the, you know, sufficient background work on it in the first place, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're taking a huge risk, exactly. right. Um, of, of putting that paper out without, without back, you know, fact checking everything in Absolutely. literally every sentence of, of a chat GPT generated text. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so, been known to dig into its own uh, positions when it's confronted with being wrong. And, and there's yeah. a reason why in some of these uh, uh, cheat sheets for, for uh, effective prompting, do not hallucinate is one of the uh, things that people have to use the most in order to, to, to try to keep it in check and to impose some degree of guardrails in, in the hallucination. But it's been yeah. our experience here that if, if, if one does impose uh, domain knowledge and 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 uses uh, these tools with uh, you know judiciously and and, and right. with, with 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 in in narrow domains, if you will, uh, they can be uh, very effective in in increasing productivity in, in in particular areas. But again, you cannot ask it to uh, to just uh, generate freely because uh, it will have huge now uh, knowledge gaps, and uh, that's been proven time and time again. So yeah. Well, it, it makes up references too when when it wants to, right? <laughs> papers, it embeds paper <laughs> papers, yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> from thin air. We, right. we, yeah. we, whenever we use it, you know, the standard thing is to double check, you know, double to double check code. For instance, it's it's it, it right. quite effective, but countless times it's happened to me and and the rest of my team that you know. You ask it, you do some pseudo code where you tell them, look, this is what I want to do type thing. Give me a structure in Python and R or whatever. And, you know, it can be often wrong. And then you tell them, no, 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 look at your second line. This is wrong. And it's like, oh, yes, you're right. I'm terribly sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this gives another pass. And then maybe it's four passes until it gets it right. And if yeah. you don't have that domain knowledge, if you don't know how to identify and pinpoint those mistakes, exactly. then you're in deep trouble. Exactly. Yeah. Joaquin, that was, uh, that was an incredible discussion. Very, as, as Richard said, very, uh, very comprehensive. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and Absolutely. thank you, you know, thank you for your incredibly valuable time and, and insight. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I know that you, you were saying you were going to share the, uh, share the research as well. The, the, um, the samples that we suggested, uh, any questions yes. that you may have, reach out to Richard, reach out to Pierre, and they'll get back to me with questions and we're more than happy to, to help out. Perfect. Thank you so much, Joaquin. Did exceeded expectations yet again, uh, second yeah. rate conversation we've had in a short span of time. So I really appreciate your valuable time and uh, all your insights. Absolutely. All right. Thank you and guys. Pierre, thank you for having me again. Thank you. Thank you.